Welcome to lab six on statistical inference. In this lab, we will begin our journey to understand statistical inference in R by first looking at a permutation test and then looking at a randomization test, which is a kind of example, a different version of a permutation test. And we'll do that on some real data. You'll notice at the beginning of this lab that there's uh, more writing than I normally have. And here I'm forming some of my various opinions about statistical inference to try to give you a flavor for how I think about it. Uh, I'm not going to read over all of these things, but I will just mention that I think that statistical inference is a creative process and using a tool like R helps us to engage in that process and create our own tools and understand the process of inference at a fundamental and principled level whereby we can justify and motivate our choices when we are doing data analysis. So let's start with the permutation test. Oh, uh, before we do that, I do want to say one thing about both of these tests. You might not have heard of, of a permutation test or randomization test before. Um, for example, if you read uh, psychological research articles, you might see t-tests and ANOVAs and linear regressions, some Bayesian statistics, and maybe not permutation and randomization tests. And there's various reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that both of these tests are easier for a computer to do and harder for a person to do by hand because these both involve a process of uh, permuting or randomly sampling the data. And this can involve hundreds of thousands or even millions of permutations and doing that by hand will take a long time. So it's convenient that we're using R uh, so we can easily do these things in R. So let's begin. First of all, let's remind ourselves, what is a permutation? And I'm gonna flip over to R Studio now. And what we have here is an example of a sequence so I've just put it into the variable A. Our sequence is one, two, three, four, five. This is one way that we could put these numbers in a sequence. A permutation of this sequence is any other way. So for example, two, three, one, four, five would be a different permutation. We can use this sample function just like this to generate permutations. So every time we resample, uh, we're basically randomly drawing the numbers out of here and putting them in a new order. So every time we press sample, we're generating a new sequence. All right, so you might wonder, uh, well, how many different orders are there? Uh, in this case, there's five different unique items. The formula for figuring out the number of unique reorderings is n factorial. So that's five times four times three times two times one. That's 120 ways. There's 120 ways to put these numbers in order. And um, finally, we can think about uh, a question like, how, what are the odds of getting a particular sequence? For example, if you, if you could have gotten these numbers in any order, what are the odds of getting a particular order? Well, this is one of the particular orders here. There's 120 ways to get different orders. So the probability of getting one out of 20, 120 is one divided by 120, which is 0 0.008. Um, in this little example, we use R to kind of test this out by simulation. So I'm going to use the replicate function. And what I'm doing here is I'm generating a permutation of this sequence, and I'm going to generate 10,000 of them and put them into um, something called my samples. And actually, I'm just going to clear the workspace here so it's easier to see. Let's look at my samples. And uh, yeah, here it is. So every column is a different permutation. So instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we're seeing 4, 3, 2, 5, 1, and 5, 3, 2, 1, 4, and 
five, four, three, two, one. And it just goes on and on and on 10,000 times. So the question I'm asking here is how many times do we get exactly the sequence one, two, three, four, five? How many times out of 10,000? So um, what I did was I wrote a little loop to evaluate every single permutation. And then what I wanted to do was count how many times I found a sequence that was exactly one, two, three, four, five. Now the way I did this was I created a variable called count examples that starts at zero. And we're gonna add to this variable right here um, just with the number one, we're going to count up every time we find the sequence one, two, three, four, five. Um, now, if I just scroll along here, oh, one, two, three, four, five, there's one. Uh, the 44th one is one of those. Does that happen at the beginning? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, there's one there. Let's keep going. Nope. So it does happen, but uh, there's another one. Oh, we already had that with 44. So it doesn't happen super often. It should happen um, with this probability on average. So how can we um, test whether, for example, this column of numbers, 4, 3, 2, 5, 1, is the same as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? So clearly that's not true. The way I've done it is like this. Um, we're going to start out, I'll show you the inside logic here. Let's take a look at column number one of this matrix. It's the values 4, 3, 2, 5, 1. Now I could ask the question, does this equal the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? And here's what we get. False, 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 false. That is, every, uh, the first number is not the same. The second number is not the same. The third number is, and the fourth and fifth number are not the same. Therefore, we get all falses. Now, falses in R are treated as zeros. So I could actually add this up using the sum function, and what I would get is zero. Let's do a second column. We get zero. So that means none of the numbers are the same. How about the third column? We get a one. So that means one of the numbers is in the same position as uh, this sequence. If we go to six, I think we saw that earlier, that's the same sequence, we get five, which means that, uh, so let me make this a little bit bigger. We can see that the sequence in column six is one, two, three, four, five. And so that would mean that this does equal the same thing as this one. So we get all trues. So the sum of that is five. So the only way we could get a sum of five is if all the numbers were exactly the same. So what I'm saying is if the sum of the this comparison equals five, then we know that the column contains the identical ordered sequence as this. So I'm going to add one to my count examples variable. And this way, I can go through all the columns and count up all the examples. And I got 86 here. So we could just look at that. Count examples, it's 86. Divided by 10,000, it's 0 0.0086. That's pretty close to what it was supposed to be. All right, we haven't done a permutation test yet. I've just been preparing you for the concept of a permutation test. And in this example, I want to alert you to two critical ideas. The first idea is we have, let's say, one sequence. Let's call this the sequence we got or the sequence we observed. It's just one that we're looking at. It's one among many. We're interested in trying to understand not only this sequence, but understand this sequence in the context of all of the other sequences. And that's an important concept that we'll explore in a moment when we apply the con when we use permutations for statistical inference. So let's go down here and check out a permutation test example. And um, I'm going to walk through this example. All right, my drawing of this example is, could leave something to be desired, but here is our little toy example. 
we've got eight people. We're going to assign four of them to group A and four of them to group B, and we're going to do it randomly. Um, you have a basket that contains eight balls with a number on it, just like in a lottery situation. Um, there's a ball for one and for two and all the way up to eight. So the balls are numbered one to eight. And they're all completely identical. Everybody puts on a blindfold and goes up one at a time to take a ball. Okay, so we're just eight people. There's four people in group A, four people in group B. Everyone goes up and randomly grabs a ball at the basket. So what are the possible outcomes in this situation? Um, we can completely describe the possible outcomes here in terms of the permutations. Uh, there are eight factorial possible outcomes. That is, there's 40,320 ways in which person 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 could grab the balls 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Here's an example of what that looks like. So um, here we have group A, there's four members. Group B, there's four members. We have person 1, 2, 3, 4 in group A and person 1, 2, 3, 4 in group B. These are all different people. Um, and I've simulated uh, how it is that you could... Um, Person one could have grabbed the number one ball. Person two could have grabbed number two. Person three could have grabbed number four. This person could have grabbed number six and three, eight. So this, this uh, sequence here, one, two, four, six, three, eight, seven, five, is a permutation of the sequence one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And every time we rerun this, we're getting a different permutation. So we have one, three, eight, two, five, seven, four, six. Two six four one eight five seven three. You know these are all different ways in which the first four people could get some balls, and the last four people could get the remaining balls. Okay, so there's forty thousand three hundred and twenty total possibilities here that could happen. And let's go down and ask some questions. Um, so, what are the chances that the sum of the balls in group A will be very different from the sum of the balls chosen by group B. So everything's random here, right? But um, will group A, uh, the sum of their numbers, will they be very different from group B? What, how can we figure this out? Um, so what I'm going to suggest we do is use R to compute all 40,320 or is, is, that, is that the right number? Um, yeah, permutations. I'll have you install the package Combinat. So first install that. And once you have that one, you can load the library and we're going to generate permutations. I'll just quickly show you that the function permn will so we're going to generate permutations for the sequence one, two, three, and check this out. So it gives us uh, one, two, three, one, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, three. There are six of them. If we did uh, one to four, we're going to get uh, 24 of them and so on. I would be careful uh, here. If you give a really long sequence, it'll try to make that the, all the permutations and that could be a very large number. Um, so when we do 1 to 8, it's going to generate 40,000 of these. Uh, notice that the way we're seeing these, uh, what, what is happening here is these things are going into something called a list structure. So if we look at the class of A, it's a list. Now, I don't want to work with the list. I'm going to unlist these things. And so that's why we have the unlist thing in there. So one second, I'll just show you what it looks to do this for one to three. Uh, when you unlist it, though, it doesn't break out these different permutations. So we get one, two, three, one, uh, one, three, two, three, one, two, and so on. 
Now I'd like to store these in a matrix. So I've, oops, let's go back. So I'm putting all of this into a matrix. And uh, in our case, the columns that we need will be eight because there's eight elements in our sequence. And I want to fill up the matrix by going across the rows. So if we just do this, we can take a look at our permutation matrix. So we start off with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then here's another one, 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 two, three, four, five, six, eight, seven. So the last ones were switched. And you know, as you go down, you can see there's um, a total of 40,000 different sequences here all the way down. Great. So this is actually a record of what could happen in the experiment. Um, for example, if we treat the first four columns as the choices for group A, and the last four columns as the choices for group B, we can um, calculate exactly uh, all sorts of things. For example, what is the sum in this last row here? What is the sum of the numbers for group A? Well, it's two plus one plus three plus four. So that's six plus four is 10. And over here we get five, six, seven, eight. So that's five plus six is 11, plus seven is 18, plus eight is 26. So group B had a higher sum than group A. That's a pretty big difference. Now that we have the permutation matrix, we can use it to calculate odds. Uh, for example, um, we could say, well, let's calculate the sums for group A for every single row. We just did that for the last sum. We saw that the sum for this row was 10. The sum for this row is 10. Uh, the sum for this row is 2 plus 1 is 3. 6 plus 8 is uh, she's 14. So we get different sums for each rows for group A. I would like to calculate all 10,000 of them. If we use the row sums function, we can do that. And so now in group A, we have 10,000 different values, and they represent the sum of all of the choices for the first four uh, people in group A. We can do that for columns five to eight and calculate the group B sums. So now we have another 10,000 numbers. Now, if we want to calculate the difference between group A and B in terms of their sums, we can simply take group A, the vector, which is, remember, it's 10,000 values, and subtract this vector. And what that's going to do um, is subtract each value that we're interested in. So let me just quickly put, let's only look at the first 10 numbers um, and see what happens. So if we look at group A sums in the first 10, uh, we got a bunch of 10s and 14s. So that's the sum of the, the choices in those first 10 sequences. And for group B, the first 10 are tw 26 and 22. So 10 minus 26 is 16, minus 16, 14 minus 22 is minus eight, and so on. Okay, so I've, uh, let's just make sure I'm doing all this. So I've stored in the vector possible differences a record of every single outcome that could possibly happen in our example. And uh, let's find out what could have happened. So what we want, what we're interested in is what do the possible differences look like? Let's look at them with a histogram. So I've just put those values in the possible differences into this histogram. And so this is a picture that shows us uh, the odds or frequencies with which different outcomes actually happen. Um, yeah, we've done it in terms of frequencies here. Uh, I suggest we do a sanity check. So for example, what is the biggest possible difference that could be obtained? That is, 
between the sum for group A and the sum for group B. We can figure this out because we know that if one group chose the four smallest numbers, that would be the only way you could get the smallest possible sum, and that would equal 10. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10. The other group would then have to choose the four remaining numbers, which would be the four biggest numbers, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And these choices could happen in any order. 5, 6, 7, and 8 sums to 26. Therefore, the largest possible difference is 26 minus 10. Um, so a, a difference of 16, either positive or negative, uh, depending on how you t if you go 10 minus 26, you get negative 16. So that means that if we were to look at the values we computed in our possible differences vector, we should never see a value larger than positive 16, and we should see a value of positive 16. And there we find it. Okay, so let's now answer some more specific questions. Uh, what is the probability that the difference in the group sums will be larger than 16? Uh, it's kind of a silly question. We've just determined that this is impossible. Uh, it's, there's no way that these numbers can be assigned to create a difference larger than 16, so therefore the probability is zero. It's outside of the distribution. And if we calculate this here, by just looking for any values greater than 16, we see that we don't have any. Well, how about this? What is the probability that the absolute value of the difference in the group sums will be larger than 10? So we look up this histogram, and we're talking now about the outcomes that are on the other side of 10, or on this other side of negative 10, if we think of these in terms of their absolute values. So we need to count up how many times these things can occur and divide by the total number of possible outcomes. So um, the first thing that I do here is I convert the vector of possible differences to absolute values using the ABS function. If we wanted to look at that, we could quickly just do this. And here we see um, the different kinds of things that can happen. And uh, the question is asking us, what is the odds or probability of getting an absolute difference greater than 10? So we can see it's these outcomes relative to all of the outcomes. And to calculate that in R, we simply need to figure out how many. So if we take absolute differences and it's, this is kind of a long one here. What I'm doing in this section is I'm using logical indexing to identify only the values that are greater than 10. So here you can see them all. These are all absolute differences that are greater than 10. Now I want to know how many there are, so I'm using the length function. And I get 4,608. And, uh, well, how many total outcomes are there? Well, there's the length of all of my absolute differences, which is 40,320. So if I divide these things, I calculate that there is an 11.4% probability, or uh, 0.114 probability, that you would get a difference larger than 10. So let's talk about some general principles here. In a permutation test, we, one, obtain data, usually in different conditions. So for example, if we were thinking about um, the above uh, toy example that we had, we would assign four people to each group, everybody would choose a ball, and then we would see which balls group A chose and which balls group B chose, and we would have obtained data in different conditions. Now, we're interested in what could have happened, so then what we do is we permute the data across conditions to produce all possible outcomes, or these are the different ways that the data could have been obtained across the conditions. And then uh, this is the part where we calculate the odds that specific data patterns or a subset of permutations could have occurred relative to all of the possible permutations. 
So we might want to know um, uh, when we conduct an experiment, we usually f we cl we f have data, and this is a record of what did happen, but we are interested in what could have happened. And what we want to do is compare what we found to what could have happened and then make some inferences about, um, for example, uh, what possibly caused the differences that we observed or what possibly caused the pattern in the data. Next, we're going to look at a permutation test on experimental data. And in this example, we will again use R to generate some fake data and talk about another toy example. Um, but it's nevertheless a, a one step closer to how we might use the per permutation test on real data. For example, consider that we are running an experiment that was conducted that had two groups, A and B. There's eight participants and they were randomly assigned to the groups. So it's like before. Uh, in our ridiculous experiment, group A receives $1 million as motivation to do well on a midterm. And group B receives $0. Both groups take a midterm. And the mean performance for each group um, is listed below. So for example, the participants in group A get 85, 75, 76, and 89 on the midterm. Participants in group B get 90, 65, 68, and 69 on the midterm. We can calculate the overall mean for group A was 80, um, oops, was, uh, 81.25. Uh, this is the group that got a million dollars. And for group B, it was 73. So it appears that the people in group A who got a million dollars did better than the people in group B. And the difference is 8.25. They did 8.25 better. All right. And so you might be wondering, what caused the difference? Was it the manipulation? Was it the fact that we gave group A $1 million? Did that cause them to do better on the test? That is a possibility. And but it's not the only one. Another possibility is that the difference of 8.25 was produced by our process of random assignment. That is, we randomly assigned four people to group A and four people to group B. It's possible that we just happened to assign uh, those people in such a way that the people that were going to get these scores happened to be in group A and the people that were going to get these scores happened to be in group B. And uh, it doesn't really matter who got a million dollars. All right, so that's a possibility. So how can we assess the role of chance or the uh, role of our random assignment process in producing differences? We can use a permutation test for this. Uh, we know that this is one way in which these values could have been assigned into these groups. And given that we have uh, eight unique values, and we just used an example from before that had eight unique values, we know that there's 40,320 different ways that the values could have been put into these different groups. And if we would shuffled the numbers, like put some of these numbers in group A into group B and shuffle them around, we would calculate different means for group A and group B, and we would calculate different mean differences also. So if we run a permutation test, what we want to do is put all of our scores into one variable. So now there's eight scores here. And I'm going to shuffle them around. I'm going to generate all the possible permutations of these scores, just like we did last time. And here they are. So here's one way we can put all those scores into group A, which would be these four, and group B, which would be these four. And here's many more ways. So the first four columns are for group A, and the last four are for group B. I'm going to now calculate the overall group means for each permutation. That is, I want to calculate the mean. Let's just, uh, uh, 
I want to calculate the mean of this row, the mean of this row for group A, the mean of this row, the, the, the mean of every row for group A, and the mean of every row for group B. And we can do that just like this. I'm going to use the row sums to calculate the sum of each row, and I'm going to divide by 4 to calculate the mean. So now we get a, a vector of 40,320 means for group A and 400,320 means for group B. And if we subtract A from B, we now have a vector of 40,320 mean differences. So these are all the mean differences we could have got in this experiment. And let's take a look at what they look like. We'll make a histogram using ggplot. What I've plotted on here are all of the different possible mean differences, as well as the red line is the uh, obtained difference that we got, uh, that is uh, 8.25. And uh, so we can basically look at this and try to make some decisions about what we think caused the observed data relative to all the ways the data could have happened by chance alone. And uh, I'll point out that what we're looking at is a distribution of possible differences to connect to the previous lab. This is something like a sampling distribution. It's... Um, However, it is a distribution of all the possible samples, so it's more like a population distribution of exactly what can happen. Um, in order to do inference, uh, well, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Uh, in my opinion, what we could do is we could look at this and say that, yeah, all, okay, so a random assignment process could have caused differences between roughly negative 10 and 10, mostly the differences will be kind of close to zero. So that means that group A and B would on average have no difference. Uh, in this case, we got a difference of about 8.25. And so how, how probable is getting a difference that big? Or let's say bigger. So anything on the right side of this red line, how probable or how likely is that? Uh, we can calculate that here by figuring out how many values are greater than or equal to 8.25 and then divide by the total possible differences. And, and I get 0.114. And so, okay. There's a, about 10% chance here. Now, what do I do with this information that there's an 11% chance? Um, I'll briefly say, I mean, I'm not really sure. I, I, it's sort of a gray area, and that's okay. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm learning is that my process of random assignment has an 11% chance of producing the difference that I found, or larger. And that's not too shabby. I mean, I, I believe that my random sampling assignment assignment process could have produced the difference. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily reject it as a hypothesis. Does that mean that uh, the million dollars didn't cause the difference? Um, no, not really. That's also possible. And, and so uh, we're using this permutation test basically to give us an indication about whether our random assignment process could have caused the difference. You know, if this red line was like closer to zero, I would be like, well, yeah, obviously the random assignment process could have caused this difference. As the red line gets further out to the tails, I become less confident that the random assignment process could have produced the difference. All right, moving on to randomization tests. So a randomization test is a version of a permutation test and we'll use this one when the number of permutations is very large and impractical to generate. So in our previous example, we only had eight different total means and we had to generate 40,000 permutations. If we had like a hundred or a thousand, we would have to generate many, many more. 
to the point where it becomes impractical to do so. And so rather than generating all of the possible permutations, we create a sampling distribution. And basically, we sample from the possible permutations rather than generating all of them. And we figure out using this simulation sampling process what could have happened by chance. So in this example, we're going to imagine you had 50 subjects in group A and B. And we're going to generate fake scores for everybody. And we're going to imagine that in this experiment, the manipulation actually does not work. So what that means is, um, I don't know, let's say everybody in group A and B is going to do a midterm. And then we're going to see if, uh, you know, a magic leprechaun or, or a magic unicorn uh, can help the people in group A. So um, we go and into another room and cast a spell that says the magic unicorn should help people in group A do better on the midterm, uh, which, you know, that shouldn't do anything <laughs> because there's no such thing as magic unicorns that can help people in group A do midterm better. So we're going to do a manipulation, but it's not one that should do anything. And that means that um, we'll be effectively sampling uh, data from, let's call it the same distribution. So we're going to come up with scores for group A out of a normal distribution with mean 65 and standard deviation 10. That's roughly about right for, you know, some test, let's say the mean will be 65 and people do better or worse. It's kind of a low mean, but whatever. And we'll do the same thing for group B. We're just generating random scores for group A and group B, and they're coming from the same distribution. So let's say that this is what we got. Here's some scores on a test for group A. Here are some scores on a test for group B. Great. Now we can calculate the mean for group A and that's 64. The mean for group B was 65.7, and the difference between them was negative 1.3. So it looks like, um, sorry, what's what, group A did a little worse than group B. So why is that? Um, was it because of the magic unicorn, or is it because of random sampling or random assignment of our scores to the groups? Um, we don't know. However, we suspect it probably is just the random assignment because we uh, used a manipulation that doesn't, uh, that has no causal properties in the real world. So what we're interested in this situation is try trying to figure out, well, what could have happened here? That is, uh, imagine that scores were shuffled around across the groups. So we'd recalculate different means for group A and different means for group B. We'd recalculate different differences and we get a sense of all the kinds of differences that could have happened here. Um, so another way of putting this is, if we were in a situation where we expected the experimental manipulation to work, that is cause a difference, we'd expect to see a non-zero difference between our group means. If the manipulation is ineffective, and does nothing, we effectively expect on average, no difference between these group means. However, because we've got variability, both in within our participants and with how we assign them to groups, we recognize we could obtain differences between the groups just by chance. And so we're trying to figure out um, effectively what it is that chance could have done. What are the kinds of differences that our random assignment process could have produced? So we want to create a sampling distribution of possible mean differences. And we're going to take all the values in group A and B. We're going to randomly reassign them across both groups and then recalculate the means and the mean difference. And we'll do this multiple times as we do with Monte Carlo simulations. So let's do it. Let's take all the scores from group A and B. And so here they are. There's a hundred of them. The first 50 are for group A, the last 50 are for group B. And we're gonna resample them. That is, we'll shuffle them one time. So now the 
there's a different order here. I'm going to calculate the mean for the first 50. I'm going to calculate the mean for the last 50. And we're going to calculate the difference between these things. So the new difference here is, oops, 1.09. And uh, I'm just going to copy this, put it here. I'm going to show you that we can run this a bunch of times. And every time we're going to get different mean differences. And we're getting a sense of the kinds of differences we could get between group A and B in this situation just by ha the fact that we randomly assigned people to different groups. Now, I would get a I would like to get a fuller sense of the possible kinds of differences. There is many permutations so rather than calculating all the permutations, I'm just going to generate 10,000 of them, which is a pretty big number. And uh, so I basically made a loop for the above thing. I'm going to store 10, calculate 10,000 mean differences, and store them in this variable mean differences. And now I want to look at them. So let's ch check it out. Here we have a um, histogram. This is a sampling distribution of mean differences. I'm plotting with the red line the observed mean difference that we found at the very beginning. And we can see that uh, our random assignment process is capable of producing differences between group A and B. And these are the capabilities here. So it's, I'm seeing a negative five and a positive five. You know, as we get out to five and negative five, there's virtually no examples out here. The tails of these distributions are very small. Most of the differences that are produced by chance are zero, which is what we expect. So the mean of this distribution is zero. But clearly, by chance alone, we can get a range of differences. Um, this red line is right inside this window, as it should be, because um, we are effectively modeling what's called the null distribution, or the assumption that there are no actual differences between the samples for group A and the samples for group B. And uh, if we were going to make some statistical inferences here, the kind of question is, OK, I observed a mean difference w indicated by the red line of negative 1.4, whatever it was. And I want to know, could this difference have been produced by the random assignment process? And I can see that, yeah, I mean, just by looking at this, it's well inside this distribution. It is totally possible that this distribution could produce this value. If this value was way out here, I would think, well, it's unlikely that a value as large as, you know, five or six would be produced by this distribution. Okay, so let's go on and do an example of a randomization test with real data. All right, for the next part, we're going to grab some real data from, here's the link over here, and that takes you to this lab manual that I've written for an undergraduate statistics course. And in, in this uh, section, this is a example about how to do t-tests. We'll talk about t-tests later in this course, but the data here is from a study by Schroeder and Epley in 2015. And in that study, they ask whether people come across as smarter um, if, when evaluators, like for example, if you apply to a job, read what you say versus hear what you say. So imagine you were an applicant for a job and you got to um, submit a paragraph that describes uh, yourself and evaluators read your paragraph or you get to submit an audio file of you saying out loud what you wrote, and then people get to hear what you said. How will those evaluators rate your intellect? 
And uh, so that's the idea behind the study. Um, you already have the data for this, should be in your open data folder, and it is under uh, Schroeder Epley 2015 data.csv. So we're going to um, download this data, or if you haven't got it already, um, go back to one of the previous labs. Let's go to lab two and look up the importing data section. And you can download the, there's a link to the download the open data folder. Okay, so as an overview, what we're going to do is um, grab the data, bring it into R. We're gonna take a quick look at it. Uh, then we're gonna randomize all of the data across the conditions. We're gonna calculate a statistic of interest, such as a mean difference. And we're going to do the above thousands of times to create a sampling distribution for this statistic. And then we're gonna compare the observed statistic, that is like what the experiment found, for example, the difference between group means to the sampling distribution. And we're going to try to figure out if the observed dif difference was likely to have been produced by the random sampling process or unlikely to be produced by the random sampling process. That is the process of randomly assigning participants to groups. Okay, so here's the data. Let's load it up. And let's take a quick look at it. Uh, it's a table like this. I happen to know that condition here refers to whether you are in the audio group, which is group one, which means that the evaluator has got to hear you say your application. And zero refers to the reading only group, which means that evaluator has got to read what you wrote. Now, um, so the evaluators then would rate the applicants on various things. One of them is the intellect rating. So these are the different intellect ratings that were given to each of the people. So for example, this person in group one was given an intellect rating of six. And this person in group one was given an intellect rating of 5.6 and so on. All right, let's use dplyr to calculate the actual group means reported in the experiment. And so what we're seeing is that um, if you're in the audio only group, you had a mean intellect rating of 5.63. If you were in the reading only group, you got an intellect rating of 3.6. So this is some of the data that the, was reported in the experiment, suggesting that evaluators will give you a higher intellect rating if they get to hear you say things rather than just read what you said. And the difference was about two. 3.6 versus 5.6 is a difference of about two. So that's what was found. That was the observed data. So the question is, was this difference a result that could have occurred because of randomly assigning people to different groups? That is, we assume, for example, that each of the people in this experiment would be rated with some um, intellect by other people. And it could have just been the case that we randomly gave, uh, assigned people who would eventually be rated with lower intellect group zero and um, randomly assigned people with higher intellect group one. So maybe the difference of two could have easily happened just by random assignment. So we're trying to figure out now, what are the other possibilities? What could have happened in this experiment? And to do that, we want to shuffle around the data of interest and produce a sampling distribution of mean differences. So I'm gonna walk through some steps to do that. First of all, we can use the select function to um, create a data frame that has the conditions and the intellect rating. So this is a slimming down of the data frame. Let's just take a look at it. 
so this is what we want to work with. And uh, let's take a look at one way we could randomize the scores across conditions. So we could do this. We could take our simulation data frame that we just created. And if we could use the mutate function, um, what that does, it allows us to change, a, change or add a column. So we already have a column here called intellect rating. I want to change it. That is, I want to take the values in here and uh, shuffle them. I want to switch them around, randomly reassign these values to these different conditions. And I know I can do that by using the sample function. So let's see what happens every time I do this. Um, so there's a reshuffling. That's just so that we can see it. I'll put it in here. Oops. Uh, grab this. And let's go to the top. So we, we had 4.66 as a top number. And then up here, 565. Five. So we're, the condition values are always staying the same but the intellect rating values are being shuffled around. So this is one way we can um, do the shuffle. So we could add on to this. Uh, what we want to do is do the shuffle. Then we want to group by condition zero versus one and calculate the new means. So every time we do this, we calculate new means for each group. Now, actually I just mentioned something here. Every time you use the summarize function these days, you're gonna get, you might get this red statement. This is a message. And this message is telling you to do something to override this message with the dot groups argument. Now, I don't really like this message. It's actually a experimental message. So they're trying it out. Usually these red messages mean something's wrong. In this case, it's just alerting you to do something. And so what I'm gonna do is say, I wanna keep the groups or whatever. I mean, you could do drop, actually let's drop the groups. Let's do that. And now we shouldn't see this silly message again. Great. All right, so if I do this whole thing, what I create every time is a new table, um, which is a which calculates the new means for group zero and one based on a reshuffle. Now, uh, what is this here? All right, um, okay, so this is the, the table. What I wanna do actually is calculate the difference between these values. So this is, a, there's more than one way to do this part, but here's one way. I want to take the data table or data frame new data, and I want to find the row where condition, the condition column equals zero. Uh, so we get something like this. Uh, so it gives us the whole row and it's true that, yep, here's the one that equals zero. And I wanna get this value. So I wanna get the, the value in dollar sign new means column. So that gets me the 4.46. This one gets me the other one, and I can sub now just subtract those from each other like this to get the difference of 0.47. Um, so I'm storing that in new difference. So it's just an example of how you can shuffle all the data, calculate the new group means and calculate the new difference. Now I'm going to put, uh, I'm gonna conduct that, that process 1,000 times and every time save 
the um, one of the possible differences in this variable. And there it's finished. We'll just use a thousand. Ten thousand takes a little bit longer. And I'll just note that uh, we can rewrite this code to be faster. Uh, but let's take a look at what could have happened here. So we're looking at the distribution of possible mean differences that could be obtained with the existing numbers in the data just by randomly reassigning the numbers to the different groups. And we can see that, yes, some differences are possible. Um, However, we can also see the red line here. This is a two that was effectively the obtained difference in this study. We can see that a two is pretty big here. It basically never happens by uh, randomly assigning the values to the groups. When you randomly assign the values to the groups, you usually get differences between say negative one and one. This is a very rare kind of difference. It's a very large difference. You would not expect the random assignment process to produce a difference this large. Now, how, what's the probability of getting this difference? Well, you could estimate that here by um, finding uh, the number of times you get a difference larger than two larger than or equal to two, and then dividing by the total number of possible differences. In this case, I got zero because it never even happened one time. Uh, however, you know, the exact distribution here will change every time you run this because you'll get a different thousand examples. So let me just do this one more time. Okay, so here, now we've got a similar result. Two just doesn't happen very often, but something greater than two did happen this time. So instead of a zero probability, we've got a 0 0.001 par probability. So one of the issues with the randomization test is like, well, just how many random permutations should you generate? I generated a thousand. The general rule is the more you generate, the, the closer you are to calculating the true odds in the situation. But I stopped at 1000 for this example. All right, um, I've listed a few different alternative ways of doing this, or actually I think it's just one alternative way. So you can take a look at that. And there's many others. Uh, it, in the generalization assignment, we only have one problem, and it's to write a function that conducts a randomization test. And we'll talk about that in the next video.